Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame." But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Our sermon text this morning is from that gospel reading from Luke of the rich man and Lazarus. It's one of those stories I think that I remember that sticks in my head and it's one of those stories from even from a little boy that I I really always loved. But uh, before we get into that text, I wanted to share with you just uh, something something interesting I think that, that can help set us up for why it is important to think about the rich man and Lazarus in maybe a way that we haven't done for a while. You probably have at some point. I mean, after all, there's really nothing new under the sun, even when it comes to sermons, at least after 2,000 years, we would think so. But uh, to kind of set that up, when, when I was in seminary, one of the classes I had to take was a, a class called Synoptic Gospels, where you study Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And these three Gospels are called that because they have similar summaries. That's what synoptic or synopsis is. Similar summaries of Jesus' life. Um, the first day of class, I was there with eight class, seven other classmates, and we were asked, what's your favorite synoptic Gospel? Uh, just kind of a way to get the ball rolling, I suppose. And I had four Matthews in my class, and so I figured, I can't remember the exact count, but I think those four probably said Matthew. The other, the other three said Luke, and I said Mark. And the reason why I liked Mark is because it's shorter, it doesn't take as long to read, and also because it focuses on the cross. And, and so as I think about that, something I learned a couple years ago when we were doing Wednesday night services is that in Mark, the first time we hear about the cross it's not Jesus' cross. It's, it's the cross of the believer. That's the first cross that we hear about. And Jesus says there in Mark chapter 8, after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, and then he tells, Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to be crucified and he's going to die. And, and then Peter says, no, no, that can't be. And then remember what Jesus said? He says, get behind me, Satan. And then he says this to them. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Even though we're looking at the Gospel of Luke, I think that this is helpful for us to think about the crosses that we bear as we approach this text with the rich man and Lazarus. We, as we look at this, we, we don't have to come to a firm conclusion as to whether or not this is a parable, some Great teachers throughout history have said so. We don't have to say that this is something that real is real that ha- has happened in history as if, 
as if uh, we could know that that's true. I don't think we have to do that. We don't have to even say that this is just a story to have us learn from, but what we do need to see is that what this tells us, what Jesus is telling his disciples is true, and that it is also true for each and every one of us. And so let's look at this text a little bit, and we see first this rich man who wears purple clothing and fine linen and feasts sumptuously every day. Purple is a dye, is, comes from a dye that's made from crushed shellfish near, uh, like, uh, be just west, like Syria, Lebanon area, if you're thinking of your world map. It was very, very expensive. There was a woman in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Acts, her name is Lydia. She was a dealer in purple fabric and dyes as well. And this was the type of thing that was reserved for the very, very wealthy. This man, he, he lived in the lap of luxury. He feasts sumptuously. He feasts every day, it seems. He, his, he actually kind of fits a, a description of, of a blessed life, of a, a life that is favorable and that has been given to some people in the world that, that Solomon, remember Solomon the king, that he describes in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter nine. There he writes in verse seven, go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of your life, all the days of your vain life, that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life, and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in the grave to which you are going." Good food, good drink, fantastic clothing, a beloved spouse, and worthwhile work. My Hebrew professor said, heaven on earth. That's what that is. There's one difference, though, between Solomon and the man who he describes there in Ecclesiastes and this rich man, though, that it's very important for us to see. This rich man does not have faith in the promises of God. The gifts that Solomon describes, he says, you can do those. God's approved of them. The reason why God's approved of them is because of faith. The preacher in Ecclesiastes commends all of these things when they are received in faith. We can receive many blessings in this life, and we as Christians ought to then receive these things with thankfulness toward God, who is the giver of the gift. When God blesses you with wealth, you should enjoy that blessing and be a blessing to others. Denying yourself of simple pleasures which God has given to you by his own hand does not gain you favor with him. They are only, these gifts that he has given to us are only the beginnings, they're a foretaste of the gifts which he has for us that he has given to us through Christ Jesus, his love, the forgiveness of sins, and eternal, eternity with him. Apart from faith, the rich man does not receive these gifts from God with thanksgiving, and in fact, he despises God, who is the giver of the gift. When blessed with earthly gifts, there are also great temptations that come with them. And I think this is readily seen throughout the world, but I think the prodigal son, that that story that Jesus tells, that parable that Jesus tells, illustrates this well. The son sees his father's wealth and is overcome by greed. And so he takes his share in an unsavory way, wishing that his dad was dead, and then he squanders it. The wealth really wasn't even supposed to be his yet, but the proximity to that wealth, knowing that it could be his if he played his cards right, was too much for him to bear, and he succumbs to it, and he sins in a terrible way against his brother and his father and his whole family and against God. It wasn't sinful for the father to be wealthy, to have plenty. It wouldn't have been sinful for the son to be wealthy if it wasn't gained in such an unsavory way. But the wealth and the proximity to it provided the temptation. The same thing is true since, Ecclesi- since Solomon talked about also alcohol, we, we should point out the same thing is true of alcohol. The passage in Ecclesiastes 9 and others like it in Psalm 104 and thinking of Jesus' first miracle in Cana, 
where he turns water into wine, highlights this for us. It isn't a sin to drink wine. It isn't a sin to drink good wine. It can be received as a gift from God with gladness and can gladden the heart and may be enjoyed with thanksgiving. And yet the scriptures are clear. The abuse of alcohol, drunkenness, is unequivocally a sin. The abuse of the gifts God has given to you, whether it be your spouse or your child or your house or, or your church or, or the, the wealth that you have or the wine that is in your cellar, is to despise the giver of the gift. Abuse is not what God calls for. Likewise, to exercise your freedom in such a way as to cause your brother to stumble is to despise your brother and to not love him and is also a terrible evil. In the end, I think the warning that comes in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, offers us some very good perspective. There James writes, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Then he goes on to talk about how all the blessings the rich have are like vapor. They go away. They're here today and gone tomorrow. And a reminder that eternity is a long time. But that's just the rich man and his cross that he must bear. But Lazarus also has a cross to bear. And it's very different. For Lazarus, the cross that he must bear in faith is his lack, the things that he doesn't have. Lazarus lacks his health. He lacks food. He lacks shelter. And we don't know who put him there at the door. Some people would say that his friends must have put him by the gate to this man's house, but we don't know that. It seems the only friends he might have is if you read that these dogs are licking the wounds that he has, the sores, in a favorable way, although teachers go either way on that. Either way, he has no one to, to accompany him. He doesn't have any friends in this story. The temptation for Lazarus and for those who have lack is to despair and to be covetous. Just as the rich man is not to lay up his treasures on earth, Lazarus is particularly tempted to be anxious about today and forget the treasures that are his through faith in Christ. Both of these men were tempted and both of them are sinful. And we know that this is true because the scriptures tell us that all have fallen short of the glory of God. Lazarus and the rich man deserve nothing good because of their sin, And it's not because they are rich or or they're poor that they have any afflictions in this life. It is simply because they are sinful. And the same is true for us. Any evil that we encounter in this world is directly correlated to sinfulness. Not necessarily a particular sin, but the state of sin that we have according to our, our human nature, our rebellious nature. This teaching that Jesus is providing here is not a condemnation against wealth or against being poor, but it is a warning. We should see that there are temptations that come to us in this life regardless of our situation. So we can't look at the blessings that we have in this life or, or maybe the lack of blessing or some hardship that we face in order to understand if God is with us or to understand if God loves us or is mindful of us. Those things are is a separate thing. God's love is shown to us in Christ Jesus and through his word. Both of these men die, and we learn that this is not the end, and this is an important point for us to see. The poor man was attended to by angels and delivered to Abraham's bosom, our older older translations will say. It's a Hebraic expression which simply means paradise, paradise. It's to be at the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's to feast sumptuously in the presence of God, receiving his gifts to the full. To know them not as a, as a future promise, but to actually have them before you and behold them. This is where those who believe in the promises of God delivered to Abraham back in Genesis 15, which we read earlier, but also in Genesis 12, and those promises that are throughout the Old Testament, this is where they go when they die. We often call it heaven. The rich man was instead delivered to Hades, a place of torment. 
This passage does not give us a complete picture of what the scriptures teach about the afterlife, and I don't think that's the point that Jesus is trying to make here, so we don't want to press too far in on these things. But what he highlights is that that is the place where the rich man goes, is a place of torment. And here, I think the main point of the teaching is that the rich man looks up and see Lazarus at at Abraham's side and calls out to Abraham and says, have mercy on me. This is the cry of the faithful in this life. Remember blind Bartimaeus outside of Jericho said, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus came to him and, and healed him, gave him sight and commended him for his faith. So what's different here? Why, why does this rich man not receive mercy at this time? There's no mercy for the rich man because the day of mercy has come and is gone. Death and the return of Jesus place a great chasm between those who believe and those who do not. Those who are the sheep of revelation and those who are the goats. Those who believe in Jesus and those who do not. The rich man knows that this is the difference between him and Lazarus. There's no uncertainty in this at all as he he talks about how his brothers must repent and believe. Abraham tells him that it's too late for him though, that there is no mercy, the chasm is fixed. And so the rich man turns his attention and he thinks of his five brothers who are still on earth. Perhaps if someone would go to them and tell them of what awaits them if they do not repent, they would come to their senses. But Abraham replies, and we should all hear this well, that they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the scriptures, Abraham says. They have the word of God. They have the promises that are contained in the words of God. And that is where faith comes from, is through hearing that word. God rescues his people and he tells them about it throughout his word. The rich man, though, is not happy with this and so he presses and I I was surprised at the audacity of him to to counter Abraham and to to try to give Abraham commands here. It's really quite arrogant, I think. But the rich man, he presses on, he says, surely if Lazarus, who is dead, rises again, they will repent And here is where we really see the clarity of the difference between the rich man and Lazarus. See, the rich man, he knows the difference between Lazarus and himself. It's it's not their sin. It's not their, their blessings that they received in this life or their lack of blessings. Lazarus isn't at Abraham's side because he was poor. And and the rich man's not in Hades because he was rich. The difference is faith. Repentance is faith. It's to believe that you are sinful just as God has said in his word, but that you are also forgiven and you believe in Jesus Christ. We often will say that repentance consists of two parts. It's contrition over sin and it's faith in Christ. That's the difference between these two. Lazarus believed in the promises of God in the scriptures and the rich man did not. And the results are clear. And in a sort of foreshadowing, I believe, of Jesus' friend Lazarus. Remember Mary and Martha, their their brother Lazarus died and Jesus heard about it, but he waited four days before he went down, down to go see them. Abraham says this, he says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And what happened when Lazarus was raised from the dead? Yes, there was joy for those who were there, but there was a group of people off to the side who hated Jesus, who also hated Lazarus. And instead of believing the words that Jesus said, they wanted to kill Jesus and the evidence of Jesus. They wanted to kill Lazarus as well. It doesn't matter if someone rises from the dead. That's not where faith comes from. Faith comes through the work of the Holy Spirit working through the word of God. So why does Jesus tell this story? First, I think that it's so that we would examine ourselves when we see what we have and see where we have abused what we've received from God. When we see the poor, are we seeking to bless them with our plenty? 
or if we're poor, if we're lacking something, do we covet that which isn't ours? Second, Jesus wants us to see that the word of God is sufficient, that there's no other place that we need to go to for faith, to be built up in our faith. In his responses, Abraham repeatedly emphasizes to the rich man and to us that faith does not come through miracles, but through the means which God has appointed. If the rich man's brothers hear and believe the promises of God in the scriptures, they will escape the condemnation of sin and will, instead of joining their brother in Hades, will join Lazarus at Abraham's side along with those who believe. We don't need to go anywhere else to find an increase in faith and draw close to God other than his word. He reveals his grace and mercy to us and his love there. Lastly, Jesus tells this story to show that the promises of God contained in the Old Testament find their fulfillment in him. At the very end of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is meet, he goes and he meets these two disciples, two of those who were in the upper room as they're walking to Emmaus. They must have left a little bit early, and so Jesus comes and he, he gives this beautiful teaching that we, we just hear about in Luke 24, 27. There Luke records that Jesus started with Moses and then with all the prophets, interpreting the scriptures and teaching them how all the scriptures concerning, con, excuse me, all the scriptures concern themselves with him. Paul then writes in 2 Corinthians 1, 20, for all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Our comfort in this life and in the next is not found in what we do. It is not found in our wealth or in our poverty. It isn't found in an abstract idea or some idea of morality or piety or of of, a a well-lived life. Our comfort is found in only Christ Jesus. When we hear Moses and the prophets and the apostles, we could add to that, and we learn from them to believe in Christ And to do good while not relying upon the good works that we do, we have a faith that brings comfort to us in this life and for all eternity. Even when you suffer greatly as Lazarus suffered, you have this promise and seal from your Lord and Savior that you are not alone. Jesus suffered more than you and he enters into your suffering and stands at your side. You who hear and believe in Christ Jesus and believe that for his sake God is merciful to you and does not count your sin against you and saves you will take your place alongside Lazarus and all those who believe and you shall dwell in the presence of Jesus our Savior for eternity. May God grant this unto us all for the sake of his Son Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen.